All right, so we are getting started. Welcome to everybody who is tuning in live for another EBFA webinar. Uh, if this is your first time tuning in for one of our webinars, very special welcome. Thank you for supporting our education and taking time out of your day to spend with us and to, of course, learn more and always uh, expand your knowledge base. Uh, today we have a very special treat, a uh, very special guest educator. However, before we jump into the actual education and content, a few logistical things is one, every webinar by EBFA is recorded and can be found on our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel is youtube.com backslash EBFA fitness. If you happen to get kicked off or have to jump off um, train clients, etc., off of this webinar, do not worry. We'll be sending an email to everyone with the recording as well as a locked PDF of the PowerPoint um, so that you can reference back and use this information and then continue to explore EBFA's education as well as our guest education as well. We will be going over some questions at the end. We do try to keep our webinars uh, within one hour. So depending on how much education is taught as far as the lecture, we may have 10 minutes for questions, but as you have questions, just type those in in the questions tab of your control panel. And if you have any questions that follow up, you can always contact EBFA at EBFA, sorry, at education at ebfafitness.com. Last thing before we kick it off, if you have not seen the new EBFA website, check out ebfaglobal.com. It's our new uh, platform, some great exciting changes, as well as our updates into what we call brain, breath, and barefoot. So with that perfect segue into today's webinar, which is focusing on barefoot, bipedalism, and the evolution of the brain. This was part of our uh, MI camp that we had this year, as well as the Feet Fascia Summit series, and uh, was taught by one of EBFA's master instructors. It was uh, such an eye-opening, very powerful webinar and education that I wanted to bring it on and share it with others, which is why we're doing it as a webinar series now. So... I am going to introduce our educator for today. Dr. Federico Luzzi, hopefully I'm saying the last name correct, <laughs> is one of EBFA's master instructors. He's based out of Rome, Italy. He is a DNS practitioner, doctor of osteopathic medicine, manual therapist, and a very innovative uh, thinker when it comes to evolution, human movement, uh, developments and everything that relates to musculoskeletal pain and human locomotion. Welcome, Dr. Luzzi. Oh, welcome, Emily. Thank you for this presentation. I'm very uh, glad to be here and speak with you and, uh, and to speak about this topic, the today's topic. Excellent. Good. So I'm going to let you have the floor. I'm going to mute my... Um, my microphone and you will have full control when we go into the questions I'm going to jump back on so floor is yours have a great webinar thank you hi everyone I am um, before starting up with the today's webinar I'm going to do a brief presentation of myself I am Federico Luzzi and Emily said the surname very well I am a student I am now a student in physical therapy I have studied uh, occidental uh, western medicine and osteopathic medicine too. Uh, with all this knowledge, I'm, I want to educate people to being able to be human again. That's my goal. And I'm founder of Sport Evolution that is a, is a movement-based company. We, actually, we are trying to get rid of human musculoskeletal pain with movement. So I'm very happy and very excited to talk about the, today's topic uh the 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 brain development and why we have a brain that is so big and complex so let's start up with the, today's uh seminar oh yeah so today we're gonna talk about why we have a so complex brain and how we have learned to be human and how we learn to be human in our life we would talk about lateralized brain functions 
And th this is a, um, an important thing because we have uh, different function in, in, the, in the two hemispheres of the brain. We want to talk about, we will talk about the missed milestone. So if the learning process of being human is all good, uh, we, we, we will actually be able to, to stay human our all, all life. But if we miss something in, the, in our development, we may find out that in, in our adult life, something is missing. And we will uh, see and, and know how and why. And we will know how to restore function again. So why, have you ever wondered why some species have a brain and why not every living creature on this planet has a brain? Uh, we have a brain and, and the plants don't have a brain and why? Uh, neurologists have always wondered why and until they find out this little uh, sea creature is called a sea skirt. The sea skirt uh, which is part of the film of chordates, like fish, birds, reptiles, and mammals, us. It lives in, in the bottom of the ocean and roaming around all this juvenile life. Then it, it chooses a rock and it will stay there for the rest of, of its life. And the first, things, the first thing it, it does is digest its own nervous system. And why it does is, is because it doesn't have to move anymore. So the, the main goal or the only goal, the only reason why we have a brain is to move. The sea skirt, when it is in, installed in, in the rock, it doesn't need the nervous system anymore. So it doesn't need something or some cells that will consume fuel. So it, it will digest its own nervous system once it's installed in, in this rock. In, in our human evolution, uh, we have experienced a, a very powerful brain growth and, and skull growth. And in, in our evolution, the size of the brain has in, increased during the years, but we, we will ever wonder why the power of nature has selected uh, us and uh, has pressed the, the, the brain to grow that big and complex. And the reason is starvation. So the need for more calories. In, in biomechanics, the laws of biomechanics, in the laws of biomechanics, we have just two factors that determine adaptation. One is safety, and the other one is conservation of energy. That, this means that biomechanically, if an adaptation is safe and more energy efficient, it will most likely be selected by nature. Walking and standing upright both fit this criteria. So uh, it's been thought for a long period of time that the dry part of Africa, as the, the, the part of Africa has become significantly drier and this grassland favored bipedalism so that the early hominidus could see over tall, tall grasses to spot potential predators and even to dissipate the heat from the grassland sun. So to, we have go down, we have went down the, the trees because in the trees there were no more calories and then we will we were looking up to see to, to look for more calories and we we trying to move in the in this grassland we will stay upright and then we're trying to see if a predator is coming by 
and we will have to we would have to to go to to look for um, new calories but some suddenly we we are we will we are not the only walking primates but if you see the an ape when when he walks is it every time with the knee bend and when the hip bend so he is walking but he is walking with his muscles and maybe the looking for new calories and 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 the reason why we have developed uh, a brain that big is not just to look for new calories and to be able to to be upright but recent findings may have changed these theories because uh, it turned out that the earliest humans may have not developed the in, in the grasslands at all we now believe that the main advantage of being bipedal has to be associated not with the biomechanical or biosocial development but rather with the changes in the development of man's nervous system that occurred because of walking upright so we needed to look for more calories but to consume less calories because if we move from a group of trees to to another group of trees and we consume more calories that we we will what um, the the amount of calories that we will uh, find out in the, the new group of trees then it is not safe anymore so safety and conservation of energy is i we need we need it to be safe enough to move well and to consume less energy so if you see in that picture the walking primates are walking with their muscles but nature has selected the primate that could stay upright with ligaments and fascia so staying upright not consuming energy to looking for predators and moving more efficiently so the main difference between walking primates and humans are the feet uh, and the what would you see the the main difference is the first ray so we have plantar fascia here and uh, the intermetatarsal ligament that will keep the feet together and then we will use the windlass mechanism to store the elastic energy in our body and to use this elastic energy one once we uh, are in the propulsion phase so we we walk and we cover longer distances but not consuming more energy so that's why we nature has selected the ones that could walk consuming less energy let's say so the, this new theory as uh came by recent re very recently and the, the the reason why we have a so complex brain is that staying upright could be not less consuming because if we if we are not in a quadruped quadruped position that is more stable we needed some control um, a control way to to stay bipedal to stay upright in just to feed and the nervous system is made of cells and the brain cells to grow and to function needs just two things one is fuel and the fuel of the brain cell are glucose and oxygen and the other one is stimulation the fuel just fuel alone we have tried this one in in laboratory doesn't push a brain cell to grow 
just the fuel and the stimulation combined together can push up a brain cell to grow. For stimulation, the most important factor is frequency. So changing uh, the change in posture from a, the quadruped position to bipedal position would place greater gravitational stresses on postural muscles, receptors, and joint receptor. The greatest density of these receptors is in the spinal musculature and in the joints, especially closer to the head. But which stimulation could be so persistent to cause this biological adaptation? Could be sight, but when we stood, stood it up, the, what we, we were seeing, it was just the same panoramas, let's say. So the, a change in that environment has not pressed the, 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 the nature to select the ones that was seeing something different. Could be the taste, but the, the look for new calories uh, didn't mean new calories. It, 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 did, it did mean new calories, but not different calories so taste is not sight and taste was not were not frequent enough because for stimulation the most important factor is frequency it could be sound but nothing has happened that will press the nature or the, or the brain cell to listen to something very different could be touch but the the group of primates were stay, stayed together and nothing has really changed in, in touch. Could be smell, but sight, taste, sound, touch and smell are not frequent because we don't touch every time something, we don't see every time something. So what, which stimulation could be so persistent? In stimulation, the, the three aspects of stimulation are frequency, duration, and intensity. And we have seen that the most important factor is frequency. So which stimulation could be so frequent that has pressed the nature to select the ones that, that they were able to adapt more, more efficiently to this new stimulation? And the stimulation that is so frequent and, and, and so powerful was, could be light, not sound vibration, smell, taste, temperature, touch, pressure or gravity. So the, the one that is more frequent was gravity. So gravity has push, pressed greater gravitational stresses on postural muscles and the the most uh pressed was spinal and neck muscles and joint receptors so suddenly the one that stood it up was were pressed to resist gravity but just with um, a very small uh contact with the terrain that was their feet they were their feet so we need to to be able to we needed to be able to resist the gravity and the, the 90 percent of the stimulation and the nutrition of the brain was generated by the movement of the spine so uh gravity we know that we now know studying astronauts, studying uh, scuba divers, we now know that a human cannot survive for a long, a very long period of time without gravity. Uh, whether this uh, not gravitational forces is in space, underwater, or just lying in bed. The results and the damage 
of being in the space of being lying in the bed are very very similar so all the physiological changes that we see in astronauts we also see in people who are in extended bed rest bipedalism in in just one way has offered the temporal and spatial summation needed for the brain growth and the brain growth and this this temporal and spatial summation was driven right to the cerebellum the thalamus and the cortex especially the neocortex the neocortex is is the part of the brain that is quite dissimilar from the other primates but if the brain needed to compute and elaborate all the inputs that are coming in from joint receptor and receptors and muscular receptors every moment in each movement it would not be so efficient in fuel consumption so we remember that the two factors that press the nature to select one primate to the other one was safety and conservation of energy so if the brain needed to compute and and to elaborate all the signals or the inputs that are coming in the brain will consume all the calories needed to move and to stay upright so nature uh, and the brain has selected the one of us that were creating a smart solution and this smart solution was the fixed action patterns the fixed action patterns are just motor types tapes of or engrams that produce well-defined and coordinated movement such as walking or, or swallowing so the fixed action patterns uh, now we see the, these fixed action patterns as a more elaborate reflexes that uh, seem to group lower reflexes together to achieve a more complex and goal-oriented behavior this allows the brain the freedom in efficient and diminishes processing capacity so the brain doesn't need to focus time and attention on each aspect of of one specific movement but it has to to be uh to elaborate just when it needs to modulate the movement in in other words fixed action patterns allow allows the brain to do and think about other things rather than concentrate on on specific stereotyped movement so this this smart this smart solution was to create reflexes that are not in the spinal cord that are not in the brain stem but these fixed action patterns are most sophisticated and they reside in the higher centers of the brain and not in the brain stem or in the spinal cord where where reflexes are so if it's in the higher part of our brain we need it to grow and to store that fixed action patterns and these fixed action patterns are actually for movement but for em emotion too if you uh come back home and everyone is yelling at you and you will uh act just in the same way these fixed action patterns actually are creating a response that is quite all the same if someone is yelling at you and you will act and you will go mad you will have a fixed action patterns and emotional fixed action patterns that that is engrammed into your brain so in order to change that engram you need to, to do something different uh in a very repetitive way in order to change and that's the same thing that we do in in rehabilitation if we see someone who is bending over or is reaching the ground bending the spine and we know that bending the spine is uh, harmful for them to create and to elaborate and to 
rehabilitate that person and to being able to be human again, we need to create the perfect or the, the good movement uh, for that particular person. And he, he has to, or she has to re repeat over and over again that, that movement to create a new fixed action patterns. So fixed action patterns were not just for movement, but they were for emotion too. And then we'll, in, in few slides, we're gonna talk about this once again. So um, the intrauterine development of the humans are quite similar to the other primates. So we, in our womb, in our mother's womb, we, the development of the, the new baby, the newborn, is, is quite similar to the other mammal. But the, this, the thing that it would distinguish us from the other primates is, of all mammals, we exhibit the most dramatic increase in brain growth immediately, immediately after birth. And so the, now you see that in two years, we have almost the 90% of the adult's brain size. So that's why we, we, we now mm, uh, tell that a baby that's three years old, it's a future man. So uh, in, in the first three years of life, uh, we will see that this, this learning that we do in, in the first three years of life, of life is very important. And then we will know and we will see that this kind of uh, learning process is not a, a conscious learning process. But we have, as human, the longest interval of infantile helpness, helplessness. And it stays up for about a year. So we have the m most the longest helplessness perinatal period among all mammals. If you see uh, a horse baby that it could it could walk or run in one hour after birth. In order to have the ability and the neuromuscular power to resist gravity, we spend one year. And the the reason why we have to be like this, like this helplessness, is that bipedalism has offered just many advantages, but just one disadvantage. The one thing that was sacrificed for the multiple advantages of staying upright was the size of the pelvis. So we needed a pelvis more strict to being able to control the uh spinal muscles and to control the, the 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 spine and to being able to create and and to uh create power throughout the whole body from the ground up um this decrease in pelvic size forced the human head to be smaller at birth and another aspect suggested by in London by James Earls is that if the mother to be would have to produce an infant totally independent both neurally and muscularly it would need an amount of energy and resources that will kill her during pregnancy so we need uh, to, to give birth to a mammal a human that is not completely uh, and well defined uh, and, and independent because the the size of the pelvis and because if it has it, it would have power muscular power and and neural power to be able to resist the gravity uh, right after birth the mother to be will, will be not able to to fulfill the pregnancy. So, 
this um, we will see that this helplessness period is a, a, a thing that is very powerful to us to create a, a brain that is very complex and, and very rich in social, emotional, and, and, and in, in, in a very empathic way with the other humans. So, healthy brain, to, to have an healthy brain, although the brain is able with the dreams to provide inner stimulation, it is mostly dependent on the outside sources to, to spark and to create neural growth. And an healthy sensory system is very essential to an healthy brain development and, and function. The one thing that is very different from the other primates and, and the other mammals is uh, the asymmetric function of the brain. We know that to move forward, an organism needs, needs to have a symmetric body, two fins, two arms, two legs. But in order to, uh, to have uh, a very powerful lower body and an upper body with the arms that will, will be able to manipulate things and to create objects and to, and to fulfill all the requirements of a social life, we need it to be asymmetrical. So this lat lateralization in the brain development allow the brain to be specific in some way to, to control lower limbs uh, for walking, running, jumping, and to being able to, when walking, manipulating things. So, uh, hemispheric specialization uh, is very originated because of bipedal locomotion. And so the four limbs, they become specialized for complementary function, grasping, manipulating, and carrying things, carrying stuff, and carrying even the, the babies. So when um, to create this sensory bath needed for optimal body and brain performance, uh, the, the sensory bath that a, 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 an infant experience with the smell and with the, the sounds uh, and with the heartbeat of the mother, is very powerful to create a very powerful brain and a very powerful um, neural development because this close physical contact between the newborn baby and the mother or the father help developing the child's brain because the child is expo exposed to a sensory bath. Sensory bath is a, two very powerful words. And, and this, this sensory bath included smell, sound, and touch. So the, the two different part of the hemisphere are left and right. And the left, it's analytical, logical, mathematical, precise, and it likes repetitive things. It likes to organize things. It likes to see things in detail. It's very scientific, detached. It's little, it's sequential. And in the, the right part of the brain, it's creative, it's imaginative. It likes to see the big picture. It likes to see the forest and the left, it likes to see the tree. So it's conceptual. 
it's empathetic, it's figurative, it's irregular. So left is controlling the sympathetic nervous system. It's, and the sympathetic nervous system is always activating things. It's enhancing the immune response. It's enhancing the digestive system. The parasympathetic is controlled by the right hemisphere and, and it's inhibiting, it's suppressing the immune system. So the left brain will always tell us to, to go and explore and the right brain is, mm, don't go there, don't say that. It's not the appropriate time to do that. So left, it's more activating and right one is su suppressing. So if you wanna see, these two types of um, function in uh, a pathological uh, and, and neural, uh, neurological uh, pathology, you, you can say that Parkinson's disease is a left brain uh, dominance. And in, with the dyslexia and uh, autism, uh, is a, 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 a non autism, with the dyslexia, it's a right brain. Um, dominance. So if something is very, very uh, activating, like Parkinson, is a left brain dominance. And when someone is not uh, learning things properly or, or struggling with academic uh, results, it's a, a right brain dominance. So the left hemisphere is controlling the small muscles is controlling the small muscles that we need to talk and to write. So the left hemisphere is verbal. Um, instead of the right hemisphere is controlling big muscles, core stability, body tone muscles, it is nonverbal. So with the right brain, we know that if someone is sad or someone is happy, and with the left brain, we actually be able to understand the single word and the single logical uh, uh, sentences. So the left hand is reaching, grabbing, carrying, and the right hand is manipulating. And now you see that all these women are carrying the baby with the left hand while they're doing some other stuff in with the right hand so manipulating cell phones or or uh, doing kitchen stuff or preparing the food for the kitchen for, for the kids so right brain right brain is controlling the left hand and left hand is for carrying stuff and the left brain logical uh mathematical is dominating and controlling the right hand the fun part of this is that we we experience in our brain development different stages where the brain is developing and most mostly one hemisphere and other stages that that we are developing the other the other one so the first three years of life, very important for social skills. We are exploring and, and developing the right side of the brain. And the right side of the, of the brain is unconscious memory. So that's why with the right memory, it's implicit at some conscious and the left memory is explicit and conscious so that's why we don't remember our first or we have some glances of our first three years of life it's because in the first three years of life we learn with the right brain and so we learn why mommy is happy and why daddy is hungry or or the opposite way um, and we know we, we can actually make a, a very very sweet smile to encourage the adults to keep and, and carrying us and feeding us. So the first three years of life is social skills. So learning how to be 
in that group, in that community. And then when we will go to school and learn things and learn how to manipulate things and learn, learn how to count things, so that's five potatoes and there's three tomatoes, so it's the left brain that is in charge. And then this in, in our human develop, brain development or neural, neural development, neurological development, we carry, we, we switch the stages from left brain and, and right brain each uh, three years. So, but we don't have to, to make the mistake to consider this two hemisphere able to uh, function by themselves. The brain works as a unit and you work as a unit always with a functional and organized connection between the two hemispheres and the connection between the two hemispheres are with the amygdala corpus callosum but even with the cortical cortical neurons so a neuron that will send dendrites and axons axons from one hemisphere to the other and we now know that uh, emotional power and and empathy is uh, mostly when the two hemispheres work together we know that cerebellum and and the basal ganglia are the same subcortical brain areas that are responsible for motor control, but they have non-motor function as well. And these non-motor function are the control of cognitive and emotional behaviors. So we have the same brain areas that control motion, control emotion. That's why we, we now in, in the EBFA are focusing uh, we, we, we are focusing our level one uh, BTS barefoot training specialist course with motion and emotion uh, things because no, we know that the motion controls emotion and emotion control motion. So um, we, we, when you, Romans used to say, mens sana in corpore sano, that means when you have a functional body, you have a functional mind. And Romans used to say that, and, and, and I am Roman, so I can say that. And we now know that it's true. So what we have to do to uh, develop a, a very functional uh, response to gravity. We know that, we now know uh, with the work of uh, Voita and Professor Levitt and all the Prague uh, phys physical therapy school that in, in our first year of life we have to, to be able to move the head, to move the, the eye, to reach with the hand, to move the feet and these milestones will create a, a very balanced body, body and a balanced body will create a very powerful mind and a, a, a brain that is balanced. If we have to pick just two milestones, now, now, now you see with these two uh, really great poster, posters that in, in the baby at four months uh, is able to roll over uh, from his spine to his prone position and then it will go in the quadruped position and then he, he will crawl and then he will stay in the tripod position and then from the tripod position he will maybe choose to stay in the deep squat and from the deep squat now the kid will be able to stood up and to stand up and to stay upright because uh, the, the kid have experienced all the uh, different postures and all the different positions and and all the different gain of strength uh, so my opinion is that if you have a kid you don't have to help him you don't have to help him 
So he, he will be able to walk when he, he has the neural and muscular strength to, to be able to walk. If we have to pick up just two uh, very important milestones that we can use even in the adult life would be rolling and crawling. So these rolling and crawling patterns are very, very, very powerful. We see, we've seen in this rolling and crawling in DNS, in SFMA, we use it in barefoot. We, you see, we, they use it in Voita. So you see rolling and crawling all over the, the spectrum of rehabilitation. So, and rolling and crawling are that powerful because they linked and they create all this connection between the two hemispheres because you have to be precise to walk and then you have to control all the body posture and with the small muscles and big muscles. So rolling and crawling and rolling before crawling are very important and then you can, you can use them to restore function. But you can use, DNS taught us that you can use in the adult life some position that you have uh, in the, in the in the neural in the first year of neural development, and if you if you pick the this position or this posture, and you will strengthen up and you will regain all the connections and all the balancing between different parts of the body, and then you will create a much more efficient movement. So you need to roll and you need to crawl, but you need it in a very rich sensory environment. So uh, we need light and deep touch. We need it in the first years of life, but we need it now. Uh, I'm 42 and I, I some way, somehow need a, a, a good light touch and a good deep touch. So massage therapists uh, are doing this uh, in a daily basis. We need to, to feel the earth for uh, electrical power to, to discharge or, or recharge our internal batteries. And uh, so staying with the skin in contact with the ground, we, we now know that we can stay and recharge ourselves in the grass or in the water, in the sand, but even in concrete, because concrete has, even concrete has the power to contact us with the with the, with the, the earth. That's why they call it earthing. We need sounds. We need uh, a familiar voice. We need uh, music. We need empathy. We need to look for others' emotions. And first thing, last thing, but not last thing. So we need the ground. We need the contact with the ground, and we need the gravity. So if we stay too much seated and I think, in my opinion, the chair is the venom of this, of the anti-human, uh, the anti-human venom is the chair, is the, the couch. So we need the ground and we need the gravity. And ground and gravity means movement. So if you, if you want to, to be able to be human again, you need all these this five, uh, uh, aspects of, of being human and the most important thing is freedom of exploration so freedom of exploration for me means learning new movements learning new things each day so uh, Emily is loving aerial skills uh, I'm now loving uh, all movement Tai Chi or martial arts or or even Aido Portal stuff. Um, so exploring new movement, uh, learning new sports, learning new movements each, each day, it's important to, to have a very powerful brain and an, an healthy brain. So we have a brain, big and complex, that is in constant need of stimulation, both internal with the emotion and external with movement. So to be able to, be human we need to feel things and we need to do things uh i wish to
thank you uh, for your attention. And I will, let's say we have seven minutes for your question. Uh, I, I'm hoping, I hope that I was not so uh, boring or, or, or fast. Oh, this is perfect. This is perfect. Thank you so much, oh. Federico. And um, I hope that everyone uh, who tuned in now, or if you're listening to it, if you've tuned in, that you've enjoyed it. Um, this is my second time hearing it, and um, very, very thought provoking. I don't know, uh, Federico, or for anyone who has, who's uh, listening, has read or heard of the book called Smart Moves by Carla Hannaford. Federico, I, no, I don't. Oh, okay, I'll have to send it to you. So it's really fascinating, similar to the stuff that you were speaking about of um, her big focus is on optimizing cognitive function is based on sensory movement and emotion. Those are the three kind of pillars or requirements to optimal learning or optimal cognitive. And um, really cool on how she focuses. You had mentioned the basal ganglia and the thalamus is she focuses a lot on the limbic system, yeah. which is what we speak in EBFA. So I highly encourage this book to Federico, but to everyone who's listening on, um, again, it's Smart Moves by Carla Hannaford. And um, really, really cool book. Um, cool. Yeah. yeah, so if anyone has any questions, you can type those in now and Federico will go over any of those questions. And if you, again, want the recording of this to reference back on it, then um, please email us, education at ebfafitness.com. And uh, of course, check it out on the YouTube channel. Um, Federico, real quick, as far as these books that you're recommending, the, uh, the Inner Fish, can yeah. you tell the listeners what that one is about? Uh, the, the inner fish, your inner fish is Neil Shubin, and it's talking about how we uh, descend from amphibious life. So our uh, arms are just fins that are spread out by the staying in the terrain and not in the, in the water. So if you see uh, someone is missing uh, some fin movement, or some uh, head movement, just like the fish. And if you see some biotypical uh, figures of humans, then you see that you are mostly fish or, or mostly uh, crocodile, because we, some human miss uh, neck, you know? And, and so the fish doesn't have, they, they don't have neck. So, some humans doesn't have neck and they need to move laterally and some other needs to move very forwardly uh, and this is a very interesting uh perspective from uh, an evolution or uh, an evolutionary perspective let's say and okay. the, the first one is uh, and the last one is uh, the one the book from robert melillo is a, a functional neurologist as a chiropractor, and his studies were, were very uh, cutting the edge of neuro functional neurology now. So I very encourage you to, to read those books. Okay, perfect. Um, so one of the questions is in regards to children and these milestones that you were speaking of, and if they bypass some of the milestones, um, your experience or some of the research by DNS or the baby walkers like if you accelerate children's walking uh, yeah. how so, that cognitively impacts them later um, so we need both physically and mentally to be able to respect all the stages because if, if you miss a, a stage you will miss uh, a neural growth so neuro growth, now we, we know that we have neurogenesis that will stay up for our life during our lifetime. But in our first year of life, if we press 
uh, to just like a game or a challenge or a race to be able to walk my my child before the his friends his breath his spine we are pressing his spine to curve right too much early uh, uh, and this spinal and muscular receptors will, will be not able to send the right message to the brain and then it will create uh, a densification in the structure and and a densification in in the brain in, in, in some way so we we will creating uh, a brain that was is not developing in 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 the right scenario or in in the of the most uh, sensory good environment let's say so pressing uh, a kid to walk before he's able to walk it's uh, pressing them to not create the good environment to the to the growth both mental and and physical and once that is said is there a way to then um kind of readdress some of those issues cognitively yeah. motor oh. coordination wise is that what dns is all about yeah always um the most frequent factor that i i see now that i'm uh, working with kids and working with adult kids let's say uh is that we miss the touch so we 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 don't press too much the kid to to walk we we actually don't allow the kid to uh, walk barefoot so we see that uh, when we took the shoes off from uh, let's say a year or two year kid is uh, it's like exploring an, a very new world and this mistouch and uh, the, the, the mistouch is from parenting because uh, parents uh, doesn't touch uh, the baby in a light and, and, and deep fashion uh, not 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 that often so they miss the touch and then now you see the this missed or or mixed sensory integration deficit and then you see with the the taste and the touch so uh, in, in order to uh, fulfill all the requirements to rehabilitate uh, these missed milestones. Uh, even both DNS and Melillo suggest that you have to get rid of the uh, primitive reflexes. So primitive reflexes are the ones that you have to get rid of in, in 12 months. So suck reflexes, palmer grasp, uh, gallant reflexes, all these, uh, these reflexes. And then you will uh, it's very, very quick to get rid of these reflexes once they are still up in the adult life or even in the childhood or, or in the uh, toddler uh, time. Uh, first, you, you get rid of these primitive reflexes and then you will create the, the best and, and, and the best, let's say, uh, missed milestones. So you put them in, in in travel position and in quadruped position and then you see and it, you can you can pick which uh screen that you want you you can pick as of many barefoot or, or dns stuff and then you ch choose the right uh position and right exercises and everything is filling up and and creating a new uh sensory rich environment where and, and a, a, a new balancing in the neuromuscular uh, capacity and that's the testing of the primitive reflexes is in DNS. Uh, it's mostly in in uh, occupational therapy, I, I guess, and mostly in uh, uh, functional neurology. Mostly gotcha. in functional neurology. Uh, in DNS, they test with they test the kid with the Voita system. Uh, there was uh, mostly there in the early nineteenth century, let's say. Uh, so Voita is, is the, the father of DNS. 
Yes, um, which I highly recommend for uh, anyone who's listening. There were a few questions through it. To learn more about um, Voitza, I know there's a Voitza method, which is primarily focused on infants. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and then DNS, which stands for Dynamic Neuromuscular Systems. Um, yeah, that's a certification that's taught all around the world. Federico, you've been through all of the levels, I'm guessing. Yeah. And you, don't you teach them as well, or you host them in um, Italy? I, I host them in Italy, and uh, we use we use we use it uh, in daily basis. Uh, we use um, mostly the uh, part regarding the diaphragm and the connection between diaphragms, so pelvic floor and diaphragm. Uh, they they create uh, fascinating things. Um, uh, testing the diaphragm with the two function of the diaphragm, so both. Uh, Balancing the the trunk and breathing patterns, so stabilization uh, function and and breathing function. So that, 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 that's and I guess we find it very useful for cervical uh, cervical problems, so cervical pathology. So they have this three months position or the crocodile breathing or something that is uh, very useful to get rid of cervical pain. Okay, wonderful. Um, and as we wrap up, one thing for everyone who's listening, and this will be of interest for you as well, Federico, is Dr. Lois Laney's work. Um, last name L A Y N E, not Superman's girlfriend. <laughs> Another Lois Laney. Um, I always have to say that because everyone's like, oh, Superman. No, not that one. Um, we are actually doing a brain, barefoot, brain breath barefoot series in Chicago. June 1st through the 3rd. It's a three-day series with Dr. Lois Laney and myself. She's going through her program, which is called Restorative Breathing. And yeah. it looks at all of the cranial nerves. And a lot of it has to do with um, vagus nerve kind of dysfunctions. But if you have certain reflexes, um, such as like a gag reflex, or you don't like being inverted, it had to do with something related to how you entered this world, like how you passed through the birth canal, or yeah. you know, were you a C-section versus a vaginal birth? And it really, really interesting how she helps to reset those, similar to what you were saying, Federico. Yeah. And then she uses sensory and the homunculus to then restore the breathing. And then we tie it in with all of the EBFA barefoot stuff to then get the coordination of foot core and movement. So um, the information is listed on the EBFA website, but I'll be sending more information out. But um, it's, it totally is a beautiful segue off of what you, what you spoke of, Federico. And I really appreciate your time. Again, I hope everyone enjoyed. If you still have questions, um, do you have a, a website or an email that they can reach out to you? Uh, we have uh, info at sportsevolution.net. Okay, info at sportsevolution.net. Yeah. Okay, beautiful. And then he's on all of the social media platforms. He's part of EBFA. Um, if you've ever been or you plan to hopefully go to some of our summits, Federico's usually there. So um, thank you again. Thank you, Federico. I really appreciate your time knowing that you are several hours ahead in Italy. Oh uh, yeah, thank you, thank you for uh, this opportunity and I uh, will uh, very enjoy this time. Thank you, thank you so Perfect. much. Perfect, good. Thank you everyone, take care.